Hello, and welcome to the episodes with Matt Pavich. I'm Matt Pavich, and today I'm joined by Yelda Ali. Thanks for having me. Thank you for doing this. Love you so much. I love you. Uh, we have known each other for a very long time, uh, so I guess we should start by sort of introducing what you're doing in the mental health space, give a little background. I know you recently got certified. Um, in mental health first aid crisis. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, in New York City, this is actually, I love sharing this, but New York invested in giving away 250,000 opportunities for New Yorkers to invest in their communities and become leaders in mental health. That's awesome. Yeah, so what you could do is, I'll actually give you the link, maybe you could share it with this episode. Yeah, we will. Um, is you could sign up if you're in New York. It's a full day class. You get certified in the way that you would get certified for first aid. This is first aid for a mental health crisis. Wow. So it's the five steps you would sort of go through. Um, if you were dealing with a friend or family member or loved one or, you know, roommate, whatever, whatever. anyone that yeah. is dealing with a mental health crisis, what are the steps to take? Um, to get them to a professional if that's where they need to get to. Yeah, that is so cool. Yeah. And it's free. And it's free, and um, you take it every two years. And, I mean, I just, I learned so much. Of course. Yeah, I learned so much, and it's been really important because so much of my mental health work is just in community, sharing stories, making spaces to tell stories, um, creating those you are not alone moments yeah, in community. Which is huge. And then also like this certification really has helped me um, with people in the community who have had to call and say, hey, I have a friend who's dealing with addiction or potentially suicidal or, you know, just going through crisis. Like, what are the steps? What do I take? Yeah. And <clears throat> it's really important for us to sort of have an understanding of that you don't have to be a professional no. to you know be invested in paying attention to the people around you yeah that's so cool i wish they like taught that in schools that would be uh, mental health has been now integrated from kindergarten to grade 12 in new york that's awesome yeah really big deal so they're teaching like, mental health that i wish so bad <laughs> that i had that man because when i was first having my issues with uh you know bipolar one um, I didn't understand. I remember going to like my dad and being like, hey man, I can't get out of bed and like, I don't enjoy doing anything anymore. Like what's going on? And he was just like, he was like, yeah, you're getting older. You know, that's the best part of life. You know, you just, you're growing up. Nobody, nobody likes going to work. You know, you, you, you're dealing with, you're getting older, that's mm -hmm. it. And I remember there was a, a boss that I had at this restaurant that I was working at and I was talking to him about it and he was like, you sound depressed. And I was like, what are you talking about? I have no reason to be depressed. Like mm -hmm. everyone in my family is alive. Like mm -hmm. gratitude. I, I have a, yeah. yeah, I have a, I have a, a girlfriend. Like I'm, mm -hmm. I'm killing the game, like depressed. That's for people that someone mm -hmm. just died. Like my understanding of depression was so linked to like something horrible has mm -hmm. to happen in order for you to feel yeah. depressed. Shit. Yeah. And that's obviously not the case. Um, you know, for me, it's like a chemical imbalance of the brain. And also, I'm sure, you know, trauma from my life and all, all sorts of things. There's, you know, so much science out there about, like, what actually triggers the depression. And then when I had my first manic episode, I felt so amazing and on top of the world that I thought nothing was wrong. But had I, I guess even if I had known, like, what the symptoms were, I'm sure it would have helped, but I have such a hard time, as you know, you've been there through some of my struggles, identifying any sort of uh, mania or uh, negative, how it's negatively impacting my life at all. Like I'm on top of the world, you know, making music, mm -hmm. uh, wearing interesting clothes, just thinking I'm killing the game when in fact I'm suffering internally and mm -hmm. having a manic mm -hmm. episode. So, yeah, that, that's so cool that they're doing that in schools. Yeah. And that's so cool that you got certified. Yeah, and actually that certification, it really, like, it talk, they give you some really cool exercises in class that you do that give you examples of how it could be living with different types of illnesses, right? And, I mean, mental illness and mental health are also not the same 
thing. Right. And I think that a lot of people don't even realize that. And they're like, I don't have mental health. And it's like, well, you may not have a mental illness, but you have mental health. Like yeah. you have physical health yeah. and like you have emotional health. And we all have to be mindful of things like tough love. You know, our, our family, they didn't know better. These no. generations, and I think a lot of us pride ourselves on like, I grew up on tough love, I'm strong. But tough love is so damaging for people's mental health. And when you tell people to suck it up and get over it, it completely belittles and silences them further. Yeah. And so this certification, it's it's amazing because it's not just here's some awareness into what schizophrenia is versus what bipolar is, etc. But it's actually it brings all types of illness to the forefront. And we we did this exercise I'll share where on that different pieces of paper, uh -huh. it was everything from you know um, ADD, dementia, schizophrenia, bipolar, and as a class, we were all meant to line up in least impacting your life to most impacting your life. Right. And I mean, you can imagine how wrong we had gotten that. Yeah. And, and I would how, have no idea how to. Right, you would never think, you, I mean, we say the word schizophrenia because there's so much taboo around it. People are like, that is the worst of the worst. Yeah. And it isn't, it isn't even close. And actually like dementia is the worst illness that people can live with the main three things to think about when you are maybe identifying, am I depressed or am I anxious or am I going through something with my mental health is, or is anyone else, you look at three things. And I never knew this, it's so simple. Is my ability to laugh affected? Is my ability to love affected? Is my ability to live affected? It's that wow. live, laugh, and love tattoo that everyone that has. Corny, that <laughs> corny, <laughs> incursive. <laughs> yes, uh, cross yeah, the of course. That but is actually the three things to look at when somebody is- my is, ability to live, uh, what is it? Live, live laugh, laugh, and, and love wow. affected. And that is and where you can identify mental health. And are so strongly affected health. when you're yeah. having a crisis. Yeah. Huh. That is so interesting yeah. and so poignant yeah. and so funny because we make fun of that live, laugh, love thing so much. <laughs> it, is, it, it is. It is just like... Um, live, laugh, love. <laughs> just live and laugh and love. <laughs> but that's real. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's real. Yeah. All yeah. three of those are wildly effective. Yeah. It, it is. I mean... Once you actually break through the stigmas of mental health, it is just about paying attention to the people around you. Yeah. You know, if you are present, paying attention to people around you, you could sort of tell who's not doing well. And we were having this convo just earlier about how, like, everyone's like, step out and talk about your depression and talk about your mental health. But when somebody's actually going through a depression, yeah. that shit looks so ugly. So ugly. And we categorize people as being toxic or low frequency and we want to abandon them actually. Yeah. And it's, I, I have this conversation often where I'm like, where do I set my boundaries with my energy yeah. to not expend all my energy? And where do I actually make sure that I show up and recognize like this person isn't toxic they might be depressed yeah. this, you know or manic or uh grieving you know um yeah. manifest in crazy ways and it's so hard when you are depressed to explain what's happening to you to another person whether it be a loved one whether it be a partner whether it be anybody it's so hard to even formulate a thought like a clear concise thought mm. and then you're expected to you know explain this horrible mm. thing that's happening to you it's so it's such a daunting task and we expect people to go get help and seek out help when they can't even get off the couch I will, or and like just exercise it'll help right. it'll help if you exercise it's so hard to exercise when you're not depressed right. and then this awful thing is happening to your brain and your body and you're like oh just you know just just wake up earlier just mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. it, it is, it is. And it is important for, I see it a lot on Instagram now, and I think it's actually very important where it's like, here are ways you can hold space for people. Here are the words you could say to make people feel seen, because I do think that a lot of us don't want to talk about it because the person on the other end doesn't have the right words. No. And doesn't, like, actually so much of the time, I'm sure that a lot of us growing up tried to speak on something, the response was a shameful or tough love type of approach. Tough love. The, you know, oh. these, these cultures are um, that are 
I mean, I come from a, such a, a culture that just like shame and woman are synonymous. Like yeah. everything is shameful, you know, to show your knees is shameful and to talk to a man who's not blood related to you is shame. It's all shame, you know, and the way that those things, Brene Brown, you know, she's obviously a huge researcher and she really talks you know, about how shame is tied to everything from addiction to suicide to uh, yeah, the trauma of it is eating so disorders. I mean, it just keeps us in the dark. Yeah. I remember this is like a tough love experiment that my dad was doing on me for a long time. Um, it's a little off topic, but I think it makes sense. Mm. When I was doing comedy and like starting out in the in the city, I used to bark, which is like when you um, sit outside of a comedy club and you say like, hey, free comedy club, free comedy show inside, come on in. And then in exchange, you get stage time. So I was not getting paid. In fact, I was losing money on the shows that I was doing. But I was so in love with stand-up that it didn't matter. Yeah. I, I knew I was going to get to the next yeah. level and whatever. And every night, I, I was living with my dad and I would go, uh, I'm going to the city to do a show. And he would go, you getting paid? And I'd be like, No. I'm like, no, oh, you didn't understand it. Mm. Every night, you, mm. go, you get paid, you get paid. And the shame that that brought me for the level of comedy that I was at mm -hmm. at the time was so strong. Mm. And I remember the first fucking show that I was getting paid at New York Comedy Club. And I knew my dad was going to ask me because he asked me every time I told him I was going to go do a show. He was like, you getting paid? And I was like, yeah. And then he goes, how much? And I was like, $25. And he was like, and he still it was never enough it was never that's enough that's shame yeah yeah and uh, it like kind of put a chip on my shoulder mm. which was good and bad because mm. then I was like you know now I wonder through therapy and stuff like why do I even do comedy mm -hmm. like is it just to show my dad that I that I can be somebody mm -hmm. and like I'm mm -hmm. sure all that is like tied to it I mean I do love comedy obviously and like yeah I mean you're such a natural thank you and the high of just like being up there is mm -hmm. something that I've loved even you know from mm -hmm. before my you know and my dad has been supportive of my career it's not to like shit on no him no 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 this, is just this was just like generational tough love absolutely this was the only way he knew how to try and get me to do better you know what? Maybe I'm going to introduce my book. Yes, please do. Um, it's called Outlet. I'll actually give some context. I picked this word as my contribution into the mental health world and all of these shiny keywords we share. Yeah. Because, you know, we all do know these words. PTSD, anxiety, trauma, Toxic. manic, you know, all these words. Yeah. Inner child, uh, healing. Yeah. We know the good, we know the bad. I feel like this word, Outlet is one that isn't really in the mix just yet. Yeah. And I think it's so important for us to recognize that we have outlets and we can have outlets because sometimes we have outlets that can start a fire and sometimes we can make outlets that could charge us up. And um, I'm gonna read a poem, one of my favorite ones, yes. called Put Your Seatbelt On. Um, and it reminds me of... Yeah, we read this the other day. Yeah, this is, this is a good one. People say I love you in different ways. Put your seatbelt on. Did you eat? Are you getting paid? You can't control how someone shows love. Are you getting paid is in there? No. You just added it? I, I, was about to, I was about to do a lap around the house because I did not remember that the first time. But, but really, but that's, yeah, but that truly. is like, you know, we all have different love languages and that's like an overused word, speaking mm -hmm. of overused words lately. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know... That was his love language, was to, you know... Make sure you'd be secure exactly. and financially set up. And, exactly. Yep. And, uh... Yep. You know, they didn't know any other way to do it. Right. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and it's fair because we have so much access. Technology yeah. has given us so much access. Planes have given us so much access. And so, you know, I think it's been a, a long journey of mental health is actually, like, releasing and forgiving yeah. Letting go, you know, and being being able to, I mean, that's not an overnight thing. That's a long journey, you know, of being able to be like, you would have done better if you knew better. Exactly. And, and that is how I feel. Yeah. I, don't, I don't bring it up to be like, no, no, fuck, no, fuck no, my dad, no, but man. you know, that parent, there's a whole chapter in here about parent child. Yeah. Because the parent child relationship plays on our mental health, whether it's, you know, your father's so successful, you're crippled by his 
um, success, you can't do anything, you have so much anxiety, or your mother was depressed and you don't know how to relate to women. Like there's so much mental health, parent-child convos that are still not being had. Yeah. And I think it's because we don't want to feel like we're saying anything bad about our parents, I right? Know. And And I mean, I definitely can say I've done so much work to now recognize my parents my God, like I have, I had the best parents in the ways that they knew how to be the best. Right. And I have forgiven them so much in the ways that they didn't know. But that relationship was the first time I ever entered a depression was directly stemming from the parent child relationship. Yeah, that is, uh, that's some real shit. And I, I don't know. Um, like to get back to, um, my experience with bipolar disorder and parents, um, and I'm sure everyone's experience with mental health is like the parents coming to terms with the fact that there is, that their child may have a mental health crisis mm -hmm. going on. And it's been such a struggle for my parents specifically. Like me and my dad have gotten into like fist fights when I'm manic, which we've, ne it's never even mm -hmm. been close to a physical altercation outside mm -hmm. of me, but he just doesn't know how to handle me. Mm -hmm. no, like, you know, and mm -hmm. it is difficult when I'm in that state to, to uh, just like sit me down and like tough love just teaches you like grab them and sit them down and you know, we get into physical altercations and my mom, is a, a very religious woman. So she struggles with um, coming to terms with the fact that I have a mental health, a mental illness, uh, and has tried to find any other excuse for why I might be acting that way. Like, you know, down to like, I'm no longer serving God, or I have, I have leaky gut. More. I have to pray more. I know these things. She thought I had leaky gut, which I don't know if you guys know no. what that is. It's like, uh, I don't even know because I've tried to yeah. block that memory out. Mm. Uh, but it's like something in your gut, it, the enzymes are leaking and like causing you to have, yeah. um, you know, the gut and the, yes. the brain are connected. Yes. And, I, and I'm not denying that I, the body <laughs> right, yeah. does have yeah. very, you know, ways of, but like I've been hospitalized six times. It's time to come mm -hmm. to terms with mm -hmm. the fact mm -hmm. that I do have a mental illness. Mm -hmm. I have bipolar one. Mm -hmm. And to those listening and to, you know, it must be so hard for parents to accept that their child is ill in a way that they can't fix. Control, yeah. Or control, yeah. yeah. So, um, and friends, like anyone. It must mm -hmm. be so hard for anyone to come to terms with the fact that there's nothing that they could do in this moment mm -hmm. for their friend or mm -hmm. loved one or mm -hmm. brother or sister mm -hmm. or child. And um, I just say that to say mm -hmm. that you are not alone, whoever is listening, whether you are struggling with yourself or you love someone that is uh, going through a mental health crisis, this shit takes time. Mm -hmm. It takes uh, a dedicated mm -hmm. lifestyle change. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't mean to make it so somber and like it's so not, intense. It's not somber or intense. And I want to make sure that like we, we don't apologize for taking it where we're what right. we're speaking about because right. this is the destigma. Right. This is the normalizing these convos. These Absolutely. convos are necessary. You're right. You're right. Thank you. And I've seen religion. Honestly, I'm glad you brought it up because I I have a religious upbringing and I believe in God. You know that cosmic force we all have different names for. Yeah. And we're all talking about. I believe in God, but I've seen religion. You know whether it's mental health or um, sexuality yeah. or physical disability. I have seen religious people pray for these people to be normal. Yeah. You know, and I mean, I just, I hope that anyone that is listening that is um, pray to this type of thinking can release themselves and knowing that like you don't need prayer, you know, you need support. You need to know you're not alone. You need to know that you are normal. Like, yeah. you know, this is, this, is, this is, 
this is normal this and is all normal. we don't we don't need uh, fixing it needs to be an awareness around how you can live your best life yes that is what I was trying to say thank yeah. you Yelda, I'm th- for thank you up for the no thank you for bringing that up because it's very important yeah and like my parents are super supportive and and, mm. and great parents mm-hmm. and even they have struggled so hard mm-hmm. with this so I can't imagine some of mm-hmm. the uh, struggles yeah. that people yeah. are having out there and uh, I just especially you know and like zooming out of America in cultures where it's mental health is seen as witchcraft yeah. you know and in my language I've heard it so much growing up was like oh yeah that person that crazy person yeah like I think they saw a shadow and then nothing was the same that spirit went through them and yeah. you know um, <laughs> I have a poem in here called those people Yeah. Um, and it's Beautiful, actually. Have to quickly get to it and read it. I wish I'd. I remember these. growing up, my grandmother, my Croatian grandmother, my Baba, uh, rest her soul, was. She taught us that she was trying to teach us Croatian, and the one word that we had learned, me and my older sister, was uh, crazy. You say lewd. Like one of our cousins told us that, like, oh, you're being lewd. And we were like, what's that? And she was like, crazy. So I came home to my Baba's house and I called my sister Lude and my grandmother came over to me, grabbed me, and was like, you are not Lude. No one in this family is Lude. Mm, so Everybody, scared. So scared. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what? Like, she's being crazy. Mm-hmm. Like, that's something we mm-hmm. it's like say in America all the time. Right. Like, well, I'm, but, glad, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Because that... The power of that word is... Uh, yeah. And I think that, like, words are powerful and... You know, that is something that I always like to also push awareness to is, you know, the weather is not bipolar. You know, Um, I am not a psycho. Like there are like psychosis, bipolar. These are real things that people live with. And when you use them with negative connotation or um, baseless references, you know, um, it's damaging. And it continues to silence people who live with these conditions. So I always do also like to, when it comes to mental health, bring up uh, language. Actually, in this book specifically, because this book is a poetry collection, but it's anthropological. So these are all real stories that I spent two years traveling around the world collecting. and Anthropological. Say that three times. Fast. Anthropological, 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 anthropological poetry. Anthropological poetry. <laughs> That's cool. I don't know that word, and now I do. Yeah, Look yeah. And um, I actually let me just actually let me yeah, read yeah. this one poem. Of that, course. Why don't you read it? Actually, okay, those, it's here called we go. "Those People." Those we're, people. Yeah. Those people. In ancient times, would those people not have been the mystics, the healers? Would they have not been the poets, the dancers, the writers? True. Yeah. The overlap of mental health, mental illness, and creativity is, uh, no one understands it really, but it's, the Venn diagram is strong. I mean, that, that veil between spiritual and physical in, I, I believe, in crisis moments, there's this interesting thing that I have seen happen a lot with people who are whether it's there in, in that moment in an asylum, you know, f- friends, family of mine, is God comes up a lot. A lot. People see God, people talk about God, people are, you know, and back in the day, it's like those people are the people that were seen as, the people with schizophrenia were seen as the most spiritual people yeah. with the thinnest veil with the spiritual realm. Capitalism in today's world has no space for spirit. No. And so, you know, I, I feel like we are on the tip of the iceberg of mental health right now. And I am very interested in this book. I speak a lot about um, like the the intersections of even belief systems and survival. Yeah. Some people become more faithful. Some people will become less faithful yeah. why yeah. you know and I think that yeah that Venn diagram of spirit and uh, mental health it's untouched yeah. like I always joke that I'm really nervous for my super into Jesus phase <laughs> <laughs> like it's coming if it, ha- if it happened to Kanye it could happen Bieber. to me. Bieber. If you want to open up for a show. That's what I'm saying. I'm <laughs> saying people get really into it. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I mean, there is a point where it becomes, there is something wrong with that when you're hateful. I think it's um, that, and how I understand it, like, um, 
some people scale too fast. Yeah. It's just the, the scale is too fast. Sure. The realizations may not be incorrect. No, no, There's no, no, a no. lot of people that take maybe 60 years to understand their spirituality and their belief systems. And there are people that scale really fast right. and quickly are like, oh, this is what I believe. Holy shit. You know, and I remember this is a funny story. So unrelated to mental health. But Tell it. I was 27 years old when I learned that dinosaurs were real. <laughs> And this is actually part of what I hope to be my first stand-up comedy, you know, uh, yeah. routine that I'll do. Okay. With your mentorship. Yes. Um, I grew up... 27 years old. Yeah. Well, because You've it's not that I had never out. learned... I had never... You know, I had learned about dinosaurs. I had gone to museums, and you but... And that's a... Uh, it's fake. fiction. It's fiction because when I would go home, my parents would tell me not to believe in Western education and these things that were being right. preached. And so there are a lot not? of Muslims in this world, probably like millions of people that don't believe in dinosaurs. Yeah, I don't think, I think even Cameron here in New York was talking about not believing. There are people that don't believe in dinosaurs. That they I, didn't exist? Or that, that yeah, they, that they're like man-made stories. Like, So I thought it was... Holy shit, I can't believe I'm wearing this shirt. I thought it was the Flintstones. I li that's why this shirt is so important to me, actually, is because I didn't believe. And when I learned that dinosaurs were real and I went to the museum to see them with my own eyes for the first time as an adult, I mean, I cried. But you my mind had was seen blown, them before. but you, I didn't know they were real. You thought it was all like a, a book? It was just like, like art. A, art. In the museum. <laughs> <laughs> Dinosaur art. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And is there anything else that you? Oh, I'm sure. Well, the, the good things is that, like, you know, Christopher Columbus and these. I never believed in the. You know, right, people right, are right. like, "Damn, the education system failed me." I'm like, "Oh, I never. I just went to learn English and math. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah History, I took the skills and. Yeah, yeah. You know. I mean, yeah. That does. That is so fucking funny, all that. Yeah. <laughs> but I will say that when I learned dinosaurs were real, I mean, it was mind-blowing. I cried because I was like, what is my understanding of life and history then? Yeah. And um, that's just that's just a non-mental health example of when, you, when your belief awakening. system is yeah, hit yeah. with something. Yeah. I mean, I remember when that Flat Earth shit was coming out. And uh, for like one day, I was on Twitter and I was like, wait a minute, what the fuck? <laughs> like famous people, famous people tweeting that the earth was flat. So I was like, is something like, what? And then I was like, okay, this is a wild conspiracy theory. But for that one, oh, yeah. for those 12 hours, I was what like, is real? my whole what is real? existence makes no sense if the earth is flat. And then I, you know, I watched the documentary on it and I was like, this is fucking demented. But, oh, wow, wow, wow. Okay, uh, we'll take a pause right here. Yeah, take a In, pause okay. right here. I just here. had a Hello. cactus drop on me. Cactus drop. Odd, did okay. The, did the thing go on there? Yeah, it fell in, okay. it's fine. Uh, okay, well, this will. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. How are you? Hey, Dirty. We are recording. But this is a fun little. Like I'm like coming in with all this crap. This is a fun little interlude. Interlude. Hey, interlude. Good. How are you? You got some Lacroix. Lots of beverages. Nice. Beverages are important. They are very important. It's so fucking hot out there. It is. I'm schwitzing. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> um, this is good, right? This is, this is beautiful. Good so far? This okay. is great. That dinosaur thing is fucking hilarious. <laughs> Okay, okay, wait, can I just quickly tell you that then I went and took my parents to the museum uh, to be like, look, big deal here, guys. Dinosaurs are real. Let's go check them out. Yeah. Mm, you know, obviously, as you know, like, do not touch signs, all right. that. My dad's walking around this dinosaur. He's like, like, checking, out, checking it out, trying to see if it's valid, you know. And when we left, I was like, isn't that crazy? Like, Wow. And they get in the car and they're like, who knows? <laughs> I still yeah. don't believe. But, you know, our belief systems are so t attached to our identity. Of course. So I mean, especially at that age, you're not going to flip around with everything that you believe because you went to a museum It's once. hard to process it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Dinosaurs. That is so funny. Um... I'm trying to think if there's anything that like I 
No. Yeah, the flat earth thing threw me for like a couple hours, but then I realized that was insane. All right. Um, let's get back into it, huh? Yeah. Do you want to take a break or are you good? No, I'm good. Okay. Yeah. What else do we want to talk about? Um, all right, we'll get into this a little bit. Um, sorry about that little uh, pause, if you will, an interlude. I'm not uh, we, sorry. We had a guest arrive, uh, a lovely guest. Um, they brought LaCroix, so we're very excited about that. Your next uh, sponsor for the podcast? Yes, yeah, yeah, our next one, LaCroix. <laughs> the episode's brought to you by LaCroix. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, you know, Yelda was uh, there for me in uh, a couple of my most challenging times. We spent Christmas together in a psych ward. Uh, she came and visited me. I'll that never forget that. was a beautiful Christmas. Beautifully sad, demented Christmas, but it was, it I, was Christmas. Nowhere else I would have rather be. I know, and that's so beautiful that you came all the way out there uh, to see me. Um, I, I was I was on the break of snapping, so having people there to to be there was something I'll never forget. But I wanted to talk a little bit about how um, you know relationships can get fucked up, for lack of a better word, when people are going through a mental health crisis. Mm. Um, I was sort of. Um, inappropriate at times uh, and I'm so thankful that you have the knowledge of these you know mental health crises to understand that that wasn't necessarily fully me and uh, I guess I just wanted to open up the dialogue for you know I'm obviously apo- apologize I think I've apologized before yeah, but, I'm- but also just um I guess to give advice on how to handle uh, a friend or a loved one who's not being themselves Mm. and how to identify that Mm. and and move past that Mm. and understand that that person's going through something. I know that's a lot. No, and I I think that's a really important combo, how our relationships are affected by mental health. and. Yeah, like I'd I'd love to know how you reconciled like those experiences for yourself because speaking of shame, like that can easily become a shame spiral, Huge or you shame could spiral. look at it. Yeah, coming down from a manic episode is the most shame you'll ever experience uh, that I've ever experienced. Um, you know, you go through. I can't believe I said that to this person. I can't believe I sent that. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I was there. I can't believe I spent all this money. I mean, there's so many just I can't believe moments. And it all happened. It all really happened on this earth in the past, sure. But, you know, it's such a mind fuck to... uh, And then the moments that you blacked out. You don't even remember these things that you've done or said. So um, that is... Is there a lot of forgiving yourself in that process, I'm sure? Yeah. Through therapy, I have been able to forgive myself for a lot of things. Um, I'm still working through that, obviously. And uh, it's it's tough. And I'm sure there are people out there that can identify with that shame. Mm-hmm. And um, I guess I'm just thanking you for being such a good friend and support system through all of that. No need um, to thank me. I'm so thankful to be in your corner, Maddie. Yeah. Um, you know, a big one that often comes up even is social media and mental health, right? Because if your mental health is bad, you can't look happy on social media. Right. Right. Um, I hear this a lot where people are like, going through things and nobody validates them or even people who are gaslit and being told your mental health is not bad you're out at that party right not understanding that there are many ways people numb and there are many ways that people compartmentalize and they were having a nightmare at that party that you don't even understand right being at a party when you're depressed oh my god Right. And I think that that type of judgment just, again, further silences people. I mean, we have to look at shame. We've got to look at like those moments where um, people are not going to feel comfortable 
sharing and trusting their own friends. And I feel like, you know, in years that I was sort of on the road deeply, you know, worse than a depression, really, just with depressive disorder. And, you know, once these things don't go seen, I also want to touch on that, is like, you know, depression can last four weeks. Yeah. And once you do not treat it. It's sort of like, you know, if you were to have um, an infection on your toe, you know, it can become worse. And then that depression can become a depressive disorder. And that can lead into anxiety disorders and which can lead into addiction, which can lead into unsafe sex. Like there are so many ways that we can self harm that I think in this society, some of it is normalized as though it's like just having fun, hot yeah. girl summer. Hot girl summer, just and, had a breakup. Right, and it's it's not actually correlated to mental health no. and numbing and the feeling of powerlessness. And when I was on the road, just deeply depressed, you know, sleeping 14 hours a day, I was making sure that I was still posting on Instagram because that's where my money is going to come from. That's where I'm getting my DJ gigs. That's where I'm letting you know the community work I'm doing. That's where I'm making partnerships. I got to stay active to that because I can barely do anything else in my life. Yeah. That this activity is the only thing that I could potentially have energy to even show up to. Yeah, and it makes it seem like you're okay a little bit too. Right. Yeah. Everything's moving, everything's I'm rolling. I'm still posting. Right, I'm, right, right. Yeah, nobody knows yep. how sad yep. I am. And, you know, I feel like there are so many people I love around the world who, like, our relationships just weren't able to be planted deep enough for grounding because I wasn't able to have space. I wasn't able to show up. And I honestly, there are people I don't remember that I know in those moments I met and I loved and I felt that today I'm like, "Mm, no, I don't remember that moment. I don't remember that person, you know, that type of, um, like there's, there's types of Alzheimer's that come out of mental health in those moments For where sure. your brain you're just not there. Doesn't, so yeah, how could you it. remember? Yeah. And uh, speaking on the social, were you done? Did you want to say Well, that? no. And I was just going to say, so that combo, um, I feel like there's a lot of people I disappointed. People that were like, I felt like we were going to connect. I never heard back from you. I, it's like looking at 570 text messages on red, you know, and being like, and that's I don't more have shame. space. And more then, shame. You, and right. Right. And then, you know, it's deep. It's deep. And, you know, I lived through this years ago, but it always comes up in conversations where people, whether they're confiding in me about their mental health, bring up the fact that, like, my social media, you'd never know based on my social media, you know, and we can't say that enough is like a pretty photo does not mean a peaceful heart and a peaceful mind. And... It's very judgmental to make it that black and white. Yeah, and it's very interesting that you bring up social media because for me, social media has been such an obvious indicator of where my mental health is at. When I am posting nonstop and pretty wild shit, um, my family is immediately nervous that something's going on. Mm -hmm. Like even now I have this album recording coming up and I've been posting like every day and that's like unusual Mm -hmm. to my behavior. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, I gotta check myself. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, no, I have something to promote. Like I have to, I have to post the shit. As annoying as it is. Um, But the the social media is just like an extension Mm -hmm. of us in the weirdest Mm -hmm. way. So Mm -hmm. when I'm manic, I, I'm my, the little dots at the top of my story are like almost invisible. That's how much I'm posting. And then when I'm depressed, I'll go mo- a month, month and a half, two mm-hmm. months without posting anything. Mm-hmm. And I always get this sense that people are gonna like reach out to me and be like, you haven't posted in a while, is everything okay? Mm-hmm. And then you remember how selfish the world is and how nobody gives a fuck. No one, no one knows. About what no your, one knows. Your, your post count no one I mean my family does and my family is hyper aware mm-hmm. of how much I'm posting mm-hmm. on social media because that for me is an indicator is an indicator yeah I chain smoke that's another indicator mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I talk way faster another mm-hmm. indicator so it's so interesting that point that you mm-hmm. made about social media and mm-hmm. how we can hide it because I've sort of gone in the opposite direction mm-hmm. when I am uh, I want pe- I, I'm almost like, hey, 
help me, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. I'm going through something. Mm-hmm. Isn't this fun for everyone to like go on this journey? Yeah. And you know what the most fucked up part of that whole thing is? You know the way everyone likes to watch a train wreck? My story count on people that were watching my story when I was manic was probably like three or four times higher than my normal story count. People were watching me just wow. unravel. Wow. And I think a lot of it was friends and family being like, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, and texting my family and like, mm. so I'm not like saying I have mm-hmm, shitty friends mm-hmm. or anything like that, but it was, it's no, just interesting it to know that, you know, at our basic human core, yeah. we love the gladiators, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. We love to, we can't take mm-hmm. our eyes off a car crash. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's just in our nature. Yeah. 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 And I think that like social media does not mean connection. No. And I think we forget that socializing does not mean connection, no. you know, and what we need in those times is real connection. Yeah. So social media, socializing, going out, it's never going to cut it. You, you look around, you think you're within community, but if you're around 50 people and none of them have looked you in the eyes, yeah, it's really hard to And, and you haven't gotten heal. past anything but... Hey, how are you? What are you up to? Yeah, so what do you do? What are you watching? (laughs) Oh my God, I love that show. You know I don't play that game, man. I know, I know. And that's why I love you, and that's why I respect the shit out of you, and that's why there's been so many times we've sat down with pretty much strangers, and we've gotten fucking deep, (laughs) quick. We're scuba diving over here. we're scuba diving. (laughs) No snorkeling. No, yeah, we the snorkels are off. We are 30,000 leagues under the sea. Uh, it's important. It is. It and is. What, and I, when you lead those convos, funnily enough, you realize like everybody's down. Yeah. And I think that. And if they're not down, something's up. <laughs> That's a bar. I don't trust people that aren't down to, you know, talk mm. about something other than, you know, just hi, yeah, mm. hi. Mm. Oh, yeah, comedy. I, I don't know. Let's talk about something. Mm hmm. I don't know. Yeah. 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 I'm taking this eyelash off you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so let's talk about the book a little okay. bit more. Um, Outlet by Yelda Ali. Uh, I went to a reading of uh, the poems uh, at, where was it? Cafe Arzuli. Cafe, are you doing that like monthly or weekly? Or I've how been does doing that a few a month. Okay. Um, it was so fucking cool. Was, Let me just talk really about this cool. for a second. Cool. It was the one of the coolest experiences I have had in a very long time. Uh, it was about 30 or 40 people gathered in a circle outside in this garden. And we would read a couple poems. And then Yelda would open up the conversation. And the fucking, you talk about scuba diving, man. We were getting so real, so quick. And these poems are, you know, perfect catalysts for deep conversation Mm. and people were just opening up in the most beautiful fucking way Uh, it got a little intense there for a minute Uh, it's necessary it was so necessary (laughs) to just uh, teach people to listen and uh, you don't always need to talk and it was it was such a cool if you Mm. follow you on what's your my Instagram is Y3LDA it's Yelda with a three Yelda with a three we'll post it at the bottom of the video and stuff Um, the book is called Outlet it's so fucking good yeah it it, it has been really beautiful the book is you you said it it's a vessel to just lead conversation I I say, like, if you want to have conversations about mental health with somebody, this is the collection to pick up because there's nine themes. We go through everything from money to medicine to shame and control and race, all types of topics that all affect our mental health. And um, it's been really cool touring this and you know, I was saying this to you earlier off camera is like my dream is to continue creating mental health spaces within community. Yeah. You know, and that's what you've done. And honestly. we and we are we are, you know, all stepping towards having that space with a therapist and that space with a friend. Um, but so much of the you are not alone feeling that we crave it happens within community and you yeah. see it within people in people's eyes yeah. so this book has been really cool for me because i think coming out of covid also 
when I thought about how I wanted to bring people together, which is something I've been doing for many years, I knew I wanted to bring people together around this conversation of mental health because um, we all did experience a traumatizing experience different spectrums of oh, yeah. how hard it was for people but you know re-entering right now I think it's very important we don't pretend it's 2019 yeah you know and that people are taking that time where we sat down and you know a lot of people did take that time to look in the mirror and do some shadow work and you know focus on their personal growth and I think that we need to keep that same energy coming out of COVID coming out of quarantine and I want to be very mindful about just making those spaces you know because yeah. they have been healing yeah it was healing to and, go to and real connection I felt so good when I left I'm so and happy like, you were there also just like my mind was just like racing with mm -hmm. like things people had said mm. and uh it's very cool mm. if you get the chance to check out are you, are you said you're touring the book are you yeah i am touring the book august in new york and then september i'm going to la and toronto nice good that's gonna be so fucking awesome yeah i'm really excited um is there anything else you want to talk about? Should we just wrap it up? Yeah. I don't really know what I'm doing. I mean, you know exactly what you're doing. <laughs> I think that you have already brought so much light to like just things that people internalize. And I'm I hope so. really that's, proud of you. That's, that's what I want goal. to tell you. Thank I'm, you. I'm so excited to just continue watching this baby grow. Thank you. And uh, we're going to have you on again. Obviously, you're so good at, on this topic. And... Uh, Thank you for Thank joining you. us. Thank buy you. the book, Outlet, by Yelda Ali. Available on Amazon. Boo Amazon, but... Boo Amazon. <laughs> no, I don't even know that what that... I mean, Bezos is a crazy person. Yeah, yeah, fuck Amazon. But um, you can also come to a reading come to a if reading. you follow me on Instagram. Yes. And you can come get a signed copy from me directly. Signed copies. Pav, thank you. Thank you.